Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for showing an interest in hearing what we have to say. And uh, we'll offer some perspectives today. Uh, I will run through my slides a little quickly, uh, just due to respect of time. Uh, if you have any questions, as Wayne says, feel free to ask in our Q&A period, or grab me after. So, we talk about, um, Sorry. Is someone doing our slideshow? Do we have a? I can volunteer. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you for all the cell phones. The PowerPoint should be on there. So, uh, I'll, I'll keep going. When we talk about diaspora, we must remember that the perspective of the diaspora is to be a, a key player in sustainable development. Um, typically, we talked about talking about the, um, the definition of diaspora. It's, it's basically someone who is looking to contribute to the development of their home country from uh, the country of uh, their residence, current residence. And there are different forms of engagement when you look at diaspora engagement. There is uh, investment, hard cash. There is uh, skills, investment of skills and time. Uh, you know, we've done many projects where uh, doctors and nurses and, and professors and educators come back and give up their time. You know, there could be a volunteerism, philanthropy. There's different models for diaspora engagement. In the old days, folks talked about diaspora engagement in terms of remittances. That is no longer the case. I mean, given and sending money back home to friends and relatives, we've gone way past that stage. We are looking at diasporas contributing in a much more sustainable development model. Um, we, we have several projects, uh, project funders for diaspora engagement. So, have you got it? Oh. <laughs> I apologize for this. Uh, we, we have slides that would have gone up. Typically, the, the, the people that fund diaspora projects are people like USAID, IUM, IDB, the World Bank, uh, UN, EFAB. These are the people that their mandate is to provide funding for developing countries' <coughs> projects. Um, if you look at the IOM Development Fund as an example, they're a unique source for developing member states. And many of the projects I've worked on have been funded by IOM. They implemented just last year over 580 projects in over 114 countries with uh, a budget of 7.2 million. Now think about that dollar figure spread across developing states around the world. Surely Guyana can take a bucket, a small piece of that funding for projects to enable our diaspora engagement and strategy and funding for development and sustainable projects. Now, what is the goal of diaspora projects? Typically, governments are seeking to identify better ways to engage, enable, empower diaspora communities to collaborate as development actors. Remember, development actors. So their sole, sole goal of a diaspora you know, person is to be a development actor, to come home and, and contribute, okay? What I'm going to do now is touch on three examples of diaspora projects that we have done in the past and show you various ways of diaspora communities engaging with their home countries. The first project I'm gonna to touch on is, is close to home, it's a project in Haiti. I've done several projects in Haiti, but this particular one is of interest because we, we got the funding for this from USAID and spent about six months implementing this project and, and running through it. Let's talk about the goal of that project. It was really to investigate the opportunities and challenges 
for diaspora engagement and investment in Haiti. The diaspora wanted to, but the, the government and the USAID wanted to get a sense for how to engage the work. You know, sometimes you say talk is cheap, but when you really sit down to work on it, exactly how many people were willing to engage. When we look at the methodology used, we use both quantitative and qualitative methodology. So there were three aspects to our methodology. The first, we did an online survey. Now, remember Haiti is French speaking and there's also Creole. So we had to do the survey in all three languages because you want to get a good cross-section of the population. You don't want to just get the folks who have had the luxury of speaking all three languages or just two of those languages. So we did an online survey. Second, we did in-depth interviews with key stakeholders, including policymakers, community leaders, entrepreneurs, both in Haiti and in the diaspora. In-depth interviews to, with about 20 questions that were developed specifically for this project to engage them on what were their motives for engaging, were they willing to invest, what sector were they willing to invest in, things like that. And then we tested our results. We went on a road show and visited four cities where there are large populations of the Haitian diaspora. We went to Miami, Atlanta, Boston, and Chicago. And then we had sessions, in-depth sessions with the communities there to test our results from our survey and our one-on-one our -on -one meetings with our policymakers. Uh, you know, this is what we're hearing. Is this true? What are your views? The findings show a high degree of engagement from the Haitian diaspora. They have close personal ties with 86% keeping in touch with their family. They also showed a willingness to give with 63% showing that it was important to support projects in Haiti and, and to donate time and money. Uh, they also showed a high interest in Haiti's economic development through investment in business. When we talk about the key conclusions and what the diaspora really wanted, they wanted more opportunities for volunteerism. They wanted uh, more transparency and accountability when given financial support. Uh, I have found in all of my projects one factor that is key. People will give to their home country. It doesn't matter whether it's $5, $100, $20. $20. But they want to know that that money is going to the project or to the source that you tell them that it's going to be used for. And they want you to show it. Don't just take their donation and walk away and then forget about them. You need to do follow-up, you need to have some transparency, and you need to have accountability for that money. It is their money given to you for a specific purpose. And that was one of the biggest problems that the diaspora, the Haitian diaspora had with their projects that we've given on the whole. They also wanted more opportunities to support development of social enterprises. Um, they wanted more opportunities for women investors. Uh, there were a lot of working age professional women who felt a bit left out in the whole process of diaspora engagement. And they wanted to connect diaspora investors with diaspora driven business opportunities, specific hardcore opportunities. What were the barriers? Limited information and support. Limited access to capital. Concerns with investment security and political instability. And opportunity costs. So that in a nutshell was our Haitian project. <coughs> project. Now, in the scheme of things, I mentioned three projects. Haiti, India, and the Congo. Republic Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. When you look at diaspora engagement um, levels across the three, I would say the Indian diaspora were, were the most engaged. The Haitian were engaged, but slightly less. But Congo, Congo was a problem, OK? The Congolese diaspora, that was the second project that we did in the fall of 2016. That was a challenge, because there are serious problems in the Congo, serious problems with political instability, serious problems with abuse, and, and it just goes on. Um, so to even get the Congolese diaspora to speak to us was a challenge. Most people were physically afraid. They were afraid that we were agents of the government that came out and that based on their responses to our questions, they would be punished. 
And we find that sometimes when it is a young diaspora that is new to the whole engagement process. So right off the bat, we had a challenge in how to engage them. So we, in, we basically partnered with a local company. So the, that, that project was based in Canada, where the Congolese government and IOM wanted to know how engaged their diaspora was in investing. So we partnered with a local company in Montreal, Canada, where most of the companies have um, settled, mostly because of the language, because it's French speaking. And we partnered with this uh, business association for Congolese business folks um, because they were a trusted partner. And we explained our project and we used them as a, a, a partner to get us uh, engaged with the Congolese diaspora. And even then it was hard. So the goal was to find out the willingness of the Congolese diaspora to contribute to the development of their home country <coughs> in specific um, sectors in health and education. We, both, we used both quantitative and qualitative uh, methods. We did an online survey, and then we did in-depth interviews with key stakeholders. But we did not reach our goal of the number of uh, folks we wanted to engage in because it was hard uphill work. When I tell you hard work, hard work. <coughs> we found 50% of the respondents left the DRC for a better education, um, and 98% were interested in contributing, 78% in education, 49 in health. But 90% of them were afraid of you know, their government and wanted to make sure that whatever they did would be aligned with uh, more global standards. <clears throat> the main barriers to invest in included political instability, personal security, and fraud and corruption. Those were the three largest. Again, they were afraid of uh, where the money would go, the personal security, and political instability. What were the recommendations? They wanted an education program using diaspora resources, similar to something done in the Ghanaian diaspora that we've done, which is an MBA program where professors from the diaspora take about a month or two and go home to Ghana and um, basically uh, spend some time in university teaching. Um, the second phase and focus that they wanted on an investment fund they wanted also investment programs to target the diaspora, encourage the diaspora to go home and invest, not you know, make them afraid. And then they also wanted programs focused on the health of women and children who are victims of sexual abuse, because believe it or not, that is a big problem there. I believe my time is, is almost up. Yes? It one is up. Minute. One minute. Okay, so I'll wrap up. I have one more project which I won't get into out of respect for time with my colleagues, but feel free to, to talk to me after. Uh, but hopefully I've given you a perspective, an overview of some of the diaspora projects we've done uh, previously and how they are um, conducted and how we might also look at conducting one on the Guyanese economy and diaspora. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Has anyone seen a Samsung blue with a smiley face and a sticker on the back? A Samsung laptop? It's a Samsung blue. Whatever it is, it's a phone, I think. <laughs> Did it have money in it? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Now we're going to have Dr. Minto to talk a little more about the Caribbean perspective and the policy framework. Thank you very much. Um, are we recording? Uh, so, so, um, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. I understand I arrived early this morning and no tea coffee for breakfast. So, I'm myself on that standing. So, thank you for, for coming. Thank you. 
discussion in diaspora studies. So what I want to do today is to, um, in the few minutes that I have, look at um, some policy suggestions and recommendations from some research that a colleague and I have been doing on the diaspora entrepreneurial system in the Caribbean. Um, just to begin, countries generally and regions generally compete using multiple um, resources, multiple levels, and the organizations and governments within these countries also face the challenge of finding ways of attracting investment, attracting innovation, attracting entrepreneurship. Um, some countries have done so through the use of um, location-specific concepts, such as uh, uh, special economic zones, incubators, and of course, diaspora, or in this case, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Entrepreneurial ecosystem, as I use it, is somewhat similar to the natural science entrepreneur um, ecosystem use, which basically refers to the construction of a facilitative environment for entrepreneurial firms to survive, to flourish. Of course, um, there is the link between entrepreneurship and ecosystems and diasporas. Uh, a number of studies have emerged in the last two or more decades, and I'm speaking here with um, Prof, um, Dr. Nurse, Keith Nurse, who's done a lot of the, the research in the Caribbean on diaspora entrepreneurship. But there's work from persons like Annalise Saxenian, um, who've looked at places like Silicon Valley. Um, there's the Berlin um, diaspora entrepreneur ecosystem, which is flourishing. Countries such as India, we, we've heard it. And the essence here is there is a, a premise, there is a, an example, and more than one example, to indicate that countries that actually engage their diaspora, where there's diaspora entrepreneurship and investment, that these countries actually benefit from such entrepreneurial activities. And so that is the case that we want to make for the Caribbean. Um, for sure, the, the, the act of engaging the diaspora um, as a transnational population has in, it, by, in its very nature a number of challenges and complexities. But for Caribbean countries, it is imperative for us to understand what these challenges are, what these complexities are, as a first step towards um, addressing these issues and moving forward. So, in terms of the, 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 the real impetus and the drive behind engaging the diaspora, um, for sure, the, 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 the diaspora um, and what a concept that I, I, I want to, 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 to look for us to look at is the notion of stickiness. And that is the suggestion that diasporans are really attracted <coughs> to their home countries. And the stickiness here is like a flight trap, and please forgive me if I am comparing us diasporans to fly traps um, to our flies. But the, the, the whole point is to find ways of actually attracting the diaspora, attracting diaspora investment, and having attracted it, to find ways of making it stick, making it matter, making it count, making diaspora stay. And for sure, there, there's a notion that there's um, investment from multinational enterprises. Where do diasporans come in? And what we're suggesting here is um, diasporans are particularly um, interesting and unique in this discussion because they have more of a motivation, more of an altruistic um, drive when compared to multinationals who may not have the same kind of um, uh, you know, um, motive, motivations for engaging in, in, in the home country. So this concept is particularly useful, let me say, for the Caribbean, for Caribbean economies, for a number of reasons. Of course, the Caribbean, um, we, we, we've been facing a number of challenges as it relates to our ability to attract FBIs. Um, there's the, the notion that there's low and declining FBIs into the region. And the three things here, um, 
I want to point out. If you look at the second column, I hope everyone can see um, the, the, the level of foreign direct investment into Latin America and Caribbean. So it's the second highest behind um, the United States. But if you go further down to Caribbean small states, you see that we actually only get, and this is a particular year, 2015, we only get 3.8 billion of that total from Latin America and the Caribbean. And for comparative purpose, again, you go a little down and you see Costa Rica, which is one country that gets 3.01. So the suggestion is that there's a, a real need for the Caribbean to find ways of attracting FDIs. And the diaspora is one of that special group from which we can, we can look to, 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 to engage. And the engagement here is not only because we need it in the region, but because the diaspora itself has actually registered an interest in engaging in the region in this way. So for example, um, a recent study showed that nine out of 10 um, of the diasporans um, interviewed in that study actually want to engage in the Caribbean, um, want to give back to their region. So, from this, we thought, okay, what for the Caribbean would be the main um, features of a diaspora entrepreneurial ecosystem? What would be the, the, the challenges? What are the, the experiences of the diasporans? And how can these act experiences actually go back into informing? an entrepreneurial ecosystem for the diaspora. And we thought, okay, let's focus on motivations. That is, why do diasporans invest? Why would they want to invest? And what are the pull factors? As well as what are the push factors? And the push factors are particularly important because there are a countless number of diasporans across the region who moved back to invest, to give, and have just closed shop and return to their, 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 their countries of residence because of the experiences that they've had in the region. So we also wanted to talk to some of these to find out what were their experiences that caused them to move. So um, the process of data collection, and, and much of this is for, um, we can talk about after or during the, the question and answer session. So we interviewed a number of diasporans as well as investors um, focusing specifically on Jamaica. And this is a, the interesting point here as well, because oftentimes we think the islands are unique, their issues are unique, but you find that the issues spread across the Caribbean and they, 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 they relate back to the different countries. So, in focusing on what um, attracts that diaspora to invest, um, some of these motivations are some that have been noted in the literature, for example, emotional goodwill and so on. But importantly is the, the, the idea of being among my own people. And that, that's the, a, a quote from one of the persons that we interviewed. Um, the, the, the legal and regulatory issues again here in the sense of the um, ability to invest as a diaspora, which means in Jamaica's case that you get the same privileges as a resident Jamaican. So these are some of the things which actually encourage the diasporans to want to come to the Caribbean, and in that case, Jamaica, to invest in Jamaica. But we also found that there are mixed objectives, and particularly for the second and third generation. So for first generation, it might be more about sentimentality, goodwill. This is the community I came from, this is the place I came from. But for second and third generations, the motivations can differ as well, where it's more focused on return. So yes, there's an emotional attachment, but I want returns from my investment. Then in terms of the, the, the push factors, um, again, information <coughs> asymmetry and informality, which is an issue which goes across the board lack of appropriately um, packaged investment options. So oftentimes there is not a, 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 a um, strong enough recognition that the diaspora is not, uh, it's not monotonous. It's not um, <coughs> one neatly formed body. It's made up of many, many parts, different interests, different desires, different wants. 
And so investment policies within the region also have to bear this in mind. Um, again, the legal and regulatory issues here, they're both an incentive and a disincentive. So for example, many of our countries are not advanced, sufficiently advanced as it relates, for example, to IT, information technology, and the ability to conduct business over the internet. And this is a, a deterrent. Um, there is, uh, um, and this is significant as well, the personal challenges that many diasporans face. So sometimes there's a tendency to think that diasporans are savvy. They're business savvy, they know about investments, and all these things, and this is not always the case. Some are not investing in the countries that they reside in, um, in stocks, for example, and so the, the information is necessary in educating the group as well. But then there's also the issue of um, diasporans who are not sufficiently aware of the context that they, they left. And so there's a tendency to think, I'm from this place, I know this place, and so it should be easy for me to conduct business. And that is not, that is not um, often the case. Um, things change, um, and I think one of the interesting things as well is uh, a local is always able to point out someone who does not reside in their country. Regardless of how good your accent is, they can identify that you're not from there. But we may feel, I am from this country and this is who I am, but they can pick it up. And sometimes we're not often aware of how things have changed and what is necessary for us to survive in the business environment <coughs> in, in, in our country of origin. And of course, professionalism um, is Two minutes. <laughs> it is another issue um, um, that's been raised. So, um, in terms of the, the, the features of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, um, this relates to the actors, the infrastructure, the resources, the policy, the le le legislations and regulations that are necessary. Um, and these somewhat reflect. Uh, a, a normal as it would be ecosystem but what we suggest as well is that there is need to focus not only on the hardcore business um, concepts and business uh, uh, protections but also to look at the softer side of investment decisions so for example the diaspora who wants to return home to invest will want to know, okay, I have a family, I have children, are there good schools for me to send my children to? Um, is there sufficient health care? Do I have access to security? That was mentioned earlier as, 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 and these are some of the concerns which policymakers also need to think about when it relates to, 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 to invest, um, attracting diaspora investment. So a number of policy implications um, from this, and I think, um, again, you know, I highlighted this morning the fact that the conference is being organized by an academic institution. And more and more, there is need for uh, an, an actor, a player, that can play the role of linking the different groups. Because there are so many tensions and trust issues within the diaspora. And the university, as supposed to be the node of innovation, research, can offer that role of, of, of um, offering that linchpin. There's also a need for tax and social security and the other complexities of transnational existence to be taken into consideration. So for example, the diaspora who decides to return to, to, to invest, what happens with their social security in the countries of origin? How does that meet with the rules and the regulations governing normal existence in their, the country that they will return to? Um, virtual solutions and the policy design needs to be informed by the multiple ways and levels in which the diaspora now engages with the Caribbean, Caribbean economies. And to this end, um, I'm suggesting that the diaspora already engages in the region <coughs> in multiple ways. And so for any government policy that looks at investment, encouraging investment into the region needs to take a whole need to understand the variety of ways in which there is already engagement. So in conclusion, um, very quickly there, 
But in conclusion, um, I, I, we, we aim to look at a number of, of, of things that we felt necessary for governments to look at in terms of their ability to attract diaspora investment. Now, for sure, it's a, a, a long list. But we be, and governments do not necessarily have to tackle everything all at once. But the reality is there is need for step forward unless we want to become and remain talking shops. So years from now, we do not want to come back to this conference and we can't report tangibles. So these are some of the challenges and some of the ways forward in addressing these challenges. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And before I introduce the next gentleman, I just wanted to put something in perspective here in terms of the power of the diaspora. And we can look at China, we can look at India. China developed its manufacturing and became the number one manufacturer in the world because it tapped into its diaspora and had three, has three levels of diaspora engagement institutions in the government. India tapped into its diaspora and became the number one in the world in technology because it uses diaspora. And let's compare where all Guyanese were trying to move forward, but we've got to look at it in the perspective of best practices. India is the top recipient of um, remittances in the world, 72 billion. China is about 69 billion. Guyana receives, depending on who's reporting, about 417 to 450 million. India's 72 billion represents 3% of GDP. But India has a ministry of diaspora affairs. China's GDP percentage is also somewhere around 1.2%. 1, 1, 1. Remittances to Guyana, 417 to 450 million, represents about 17 to 23% of GDP. But we do not have a ministry of diaspora affairs. We do not have a quasi-ministry, we do not have a sub-ministry of diaspora affairs. And so these are the tangible things that we want to address to ensure that because of the fact that the diaspora represents 23% of GDP with 450 million, that we have things in place to increase those remittances. Imagine what that could be. Recently, our remittances declined by about a few percentage points, but about 17 million, and Minister Jordan indicated that. And so that has affected the economy also. How do we put mechanisms in place to harness and, and use more creative ways to attract remittance asset uh, instruments? So we can talk about that, very complex. It can be done, other countries have done it. But this all comes back to policy. We are working on, and we're hoping that uh, Minister Greenwich this afternoon will reveal a policy document, not a policy, a strategy document prepared by the IOM uh, last year, and it will talk about how Guyana, the Guyana government should engage the diaspora in utilizing and, and harnessing all of their skills, human and financial capital, not just remittances, not just returning home. So the policy aspect of that is critical in moving Guyana forward in many ways, and this subject we can talk about for an entire week. But before that, I just wanted to share that information and put it in perspective before I turn it over here to the distinguished panelists. Well, I'm happy to see that Wayne is here because last night we took him to the Diamond Hospital. He had a little accident. Are you better? Thank God. I'm very happy that I'm talking about Guyana diaspora policy, which we have not seen as yet, but we do have two honorable ministers present who have graced us. So it means that whatever comments I make, I hope they will listen to it. Honorable views and my dear friend Keith Scott, we go back. So what I'll do is this, I'm going to read a few quotes that create kind of a climate for some of the remarks I'll make and a bit provocative perhaps for discussion. The first point is that in terms of the diaspora, 65% is in the US, 23% is in Canada, 5% in the UK, 2% in Suriname, 
5% in the wider Caribbean, but they have not calculated the Guyanese in Sudan, Bolivar, and also on the Brazilian border. And the World Bank said that we have the highest rate, 89% of migration of tertiary education graduates in the world. And we are here at UG, right? Now the Minister of Finance said something very interesting. He said we have the money voted, and we have $250 billion voted in this year's budget, but we had a whole set voted last year. A lot of it came back. And he was saying that we have money, but we don't have the human resource. A, he's also said that when the oil money comes, if you have all this money coming in for all these demands for projects and so on, you can expect what would happen. The system will collapse. The sudden influx of money, sudden demand for projects, sudden demand for other things, so we have to fix the system now. President Granger said, no, let me go to Minister Greenwich first. Minister Greenwich said, he has assured overseas Guyanese that they are not being ignored, but his ministry is not an employment bureau. And President Granger said that he has called on overseas Guyanese to stop writing petitions and instead come back and invest in the village economies. And I see David is here, my very good friend. I think it was the event he was at. He said he loves the diaspora and credit them with supporting him in his coalition election campaign. Orozco, who is from a think tank in Washington Inter-American Dialogue some, in 2003 said, remittances represent more than foreign direct investment and nearly as much as current official development assistance from all donor parties. Can you believe that? They represent 60% of the trade of the, with the United States. That one I, I have to research a bit better, but when you go to New York and you see all those products there, it's not a big surprise. I'm gonna quickly run through what I've written here. And, and basically, um, it's a disadvantage because I haven't seen it as for policy. So I'm gonna make a few remarks with the hope that uh, I could emphasize the problems you face with recommendation. I'd like to state from the very beginning that Guyanese who have settled, for example, in the USA and Canada 10 years ago are not knocking on the doors of Guyana to come back. It's the other way around. Guyanese at home are knocking on the doors of Canada and the US. And we just saw what the American ambassador said last year. There were, I think it was 80,000 or 67,000. And most of it were visas, visitors' visas, one foot here, one foot there, and about 12,000 were permanent residents. Uh, so, another point I'd like to make is this, that um, a report from the official government organ, the Guyana government stated that assurances that the government is sticking to one of its campaign promises to engage the diaspora is a structure, in a structured manner has followed public concerns by a group of pro-government Guyanese in New York who have claimed that they are being treated as outcasts, although they have campaigned for and provided financial support for the AFP and UAFC. Those who have not been accommodated as a last resort call for a diaspora policy, which amounts to a disguise mechanism for pay for play. A third clarification, there are Guyanese abroad who support campaigns as patriots for Guyana's democratization and development and do not invoke this political practice. It is therefore advisable that the government officials in their speeches and statements make a distinction between the political party activists and the overwhelming majority of Guyanese abroad. My fourth clarification is that Guyanese abroad consistently contributes to Guyana to, and to their credit they did not abandon their families, their communities and their schools. They hold two or three jobs in the USA and Canada in order to send remittances to their loved ones in the homeland. These remittances constitute a significant percentage of Ghana's GDP in trade, health, care, tourism, and even funeral parlors. Guyanese abroad contribute significantly to the democratization of the homeland. Now, Guyanese of all ethnicities and social classes have migrated to foreign lands fundamentally because 
Guyana is among the poorest nation states in the hemisphere. Political independence and interchanging rule of hegemonic ethnic elites have not disturbed this trend. The prognosis for the immediate and short term is that migration will continue to escalate. A diaspora policy that aspires to stop migration hemorrhage and harness the resources of Guyanese abroad faces multiple implementation challenges. Political parties and governments through their international work have connected Guyanese abroad and have successfully obtained their active support as lobbyists in settlement countries that wield real power and influence in the homeland. One of the major challenges in the homeland government, in the homeland governments, and political parties facing their efforts to mobilize the Guyanese abroad is the absence of a vision and inability to implement a principled anti-racist strategy and reach a consensus on the country's national identity beyond race to effectively address the persistence of polarization within the homeland. But polarization also exists in the diaspora. And believe it or not, polarization, in my opinion, whether in America or here or across the world, is the mother of self-destruction. Polarization is an ethno-cultural baggage that accompanied those who migrated abroad. We took it abroad. Guyanese in Queens and Brooklyn, New York, are as far apart as the Guyanese in Boston and Enterprise. Yes, sir. The organizational activities of political parties at home are very similar to those abroad. So the political parties and the governments are part of the problem instead of the cure. Polarization is a major hurdle that threatens the successful implementation of an effective diaspora policy that can produce tangible outcomes. A serious attempt by homeland governments to conceptualize and design a diaspora policy began to take shape when Guyana became a member of the IOM in September 2012, and so on and so forth. And they have been working, as uh, was pointed out, on a plan which very soon probably Minister will, uh, Greenwich will explain to us. But the point is that the human resource gap is a major challenge for Guyana. How do we resolve that? It is evident from the speeches of various ministers of the Guyana government that the diaspora policy has already been crafted. It is merely a matter of its formal presentation. And Mr. Minister Harmon said uh, that in 2017 that the ministerial subcommittee that include ministers of foreign affairs, public security, state, finance, business, and citizenship have been tasked to produce a diaspora policy. There has been a bit of a problem when a government comes in office very uh, in a couple of a year or so. They always find it difficult to yeah, to coordinate something. So what we've been having is messages from the Prime Minister's of office, the President's office, and various ministries. But this is a problem we face with bureaucracy. I have monitored the IMF, the World Bank, the WTA, the UN, and it's the same old story in my university. Uh, we have to cross the borders that people set up. I call it the TC. What we have to do in the implementation of the diaspora policy is to fundamentally cooperate, coordinate, and have coherence. And, uh, you know, people always set up silos on these kind of things. So there's, a, there's fundamentally, when you do have a policy, that you will face a bureaucratic coordination challenge. The current government came to office, uh, and you know, speaking about the early days, I could remember one minister said that he has appointed 40 people to be advised. And then Minister Harmon came over the next and he said, I'm appointing 40 more advisors. So I asked one of the advisors, hey boy, were you advising about? He said, me no. <laughs> <laughs> It reminds me of an old friend of mine who was in the PPP, a young boy in Freedom House. And he gets get a job, he's political advisor in the president of Mr. Chen Yang. So I said, boy, you get a big work. He said, pal, you really believe me or big political advisor to Chen Yang? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the current government came to office on the promise to effectively deal with corruption. You know, there's another thing I want to say and I've been linking it in my mind. 
I did a job in Trinidad and Tobago in the 90s, the mid 90s, to open markets for Latin America, for Trinidad and Tobago, and I was paid by Point Jesus Industrial Estate. So my job was to remove non-tariff barriers, because as I went around all the chambers of commerce, I said, hey Paul, how will you do trade with Venezuela? Uh, the National Guard is corrupt. We can't speak Spanish and this and that and the other. So okay, take it easy. That's my job. I'm going to move the non-tariff barriers. And it seems to me as I think more and more about bringing the ASPRA back or getting them involved in our nation building, <laughs> that it's non-tariff barriers, issues we are dealing with. Uh, and these, these are issues like corruption, like security, these kinds of issues. So it's something for us to think about. So, the current government came to office on the promise to effectively deal with corruption overall and provide millennials with an alternative to one of the highest suicide rates in the world, high unemployment and immigration. The population in Guyana is disappointed with the deliverables of the current administration until now, there's still time, you know. In the listening interviews I conducted for the Roraima Institute in five regions, this was confirmed. Guyana has local government election, and this is very, very important. I grew up in the local government system. My father was an overseer, my grandfather was the chairman of the village. However, Guyanese abroad actively communicate with their relatives at home who inform them that locally elected bodies are not functioning effectively. Because we have to have development from below and we have to connect the diaspora with the community. How many minutes is that? I don't see where About two. Good. So, I have 12 recommendations. And God knows. They ain't no way. That I can. You see, I've been accustomed to talking to a crowd in Haiti for three hours. Believe it or not. And not a pin drop when I spoke. Anyhow, guys. On a more serious note, I have a, mark, I recommend, a number of recommendations, but I'm going to deal with one because it's a serious issue. Guyanese must deal with polarization. Currently, 16,000 or 10 sugar workers may lose their jobs. The sugar industry is in a state of collapse. It is not merely an economic issue, but an ethno-cultural and national issue that will have repercussions abroad, and this will link the diaspora with the sugar industry. Who will provide for the families when they become jobless without incomes? The Guyana diaspora will be impacted. Those families at home threatened by starvation will make increased demands on their relatives abroad that they already have, who are already sending remittances or will have to begin to do so. Guyanese at home and abroad will be impacted and polarization will be this issue must be addressed effectively and patriotically. And I pray to God that the Guyanese diaspora do not become part of the problem, but that we try our best to see how we can contribute to, the, to, uh, to making this problem be resolved and the impact both at home and abroad is not as severe. Let me see if I have another nice recommendation here. <laughs> The millennials. I want to speak about the millennials because I teach the millennials in Washington, D.C. And here in Guyana, I found that the same millennials, the same concerns back there is on their minds here. And the same kind of interaction and the way I have to learn about them, you know, it's real. And um, there has to be a space for the millennials here. And our millennials over there, whose parents are Guyanese, we have to somehow have a program to get them to think about Ghana, because in the developed countries, young people are very committed to developing countries. So I'll make two last points and um, in my recommendation. Good governance is vital to the successful implementation of a Ghana development plan and a diaspora policy. What I've stated in the very beginning, and I feel strongly about it, is that the diaspora policy cannot stand alone. Guyana urgently needs a comprehensive development plan in which the diaspora policy is adequately covered. We can't disconnect it. It has to be a plan in which we... So we say 
Good governance is vital to the successful implementation of a Guyana development plan and I ask for policy. This is clearly linked to the radical and democratic constitutional reform. I don't want to make one quick point to provoke people. I do not support, Guyanese abroad have the right to vote, but I want to make one amendment. I believe that the Constitution should provide for at least one seat for one person in the Parliament of Guyana, and that person should be elected from the outside to be the voice of the Guyana. But I believe for you to vote in a country, you have to live and get a blackout. <laughs> You're right? You can't do that. And you don't pay taxes here. And you know, Mr. IRS, you know, all this money I'm spending here, I, I collect in the receipts. I got to send it to the IRS. So, folks, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy that we have two ministers here, and they're two listening ministers. And you all should take advantage, we should take advantage to say what you can in their ears, because they are going to formulate policies that will affect this country for a long, long time. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. This brings us to the end of the panel presentation and we will go to questions and answers. And just to respond to one thing that, uh, that Paul said, there are over 17 countries that, that allow uh, overseas voting rights. So, uh, and, and I can name all of them, but I don't think you want to hear it. And there are more that I may have missed. And let me just point out one thing that's critical here, because we want solutions. We want to see Guyana move forward. And we want to ensure that there's collaboration, there's cooperation, and there's synergy. I met with uh, former President Jack Dio in Orlando sometime last year, and I asked him a public question. I said, after 50 years of independence, Mr. Jack Yu, why is it that Guyana does not have a diaspora policy? And he responded, well, Jamaica has Haiti, Dominica, Philippines, around the world. And he responded, he said, we have failed. He was a president too for 12 years. He said, we have failed. We don't want to hear that we have failed next year when we meet. We want to ensure that at that point in time, we will say we are moving forward. Yes. Thank you. So we're going to take some questions. You know, I your views in terms of the question of sustainability, uh, both in terms of those in Thank you. Um, just a couple of comments um, to look at. I think there, there's a gap in these studies. Um, we often don't study um, diasporans who've been back. I've been here 12 years, mm -hmm. and that would give you a context as to why diaspora policy or, or issues are, are critical. Secondly, I, I think we need to have a study that looks across these five dimensions, because power, difference, cultural differences, when you go overseas and live all these years, you're different in your approach, and yet I don't see that in um, Third. The private sector structure. We talk about investments, but there's been no study that looks at the private sector structure and functions and the polarization and the access to capital. All of these are studies that have been done in the Caribbean that gives a particular context. And the reason I'm, I'm raising all of these is that in order to create a good policy, all of these ingredients have to be brought together, including what Ms. Williams said and Paul said. May I have a mic, please? I don't think you can get there unless you want to Oh, no, no, that's okay. I, I, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Oslin Carrington, and I'm, uh, I happen to be uh, the Executive Director of Economic and Workforce Development at City University of New York, so I'm really pleased to be here. Um, my question is about foreign direct investment, and specifically two things. One, uh, diaspora bonds, and whether that is something that we are actively looking at, as whether it's from a policy standpoint or it's in the private sector. Um, this is the, most Guyanese people, including myself, will probably not be in a position in the short run to move back here and launch a business. One, for practical reasons in terms of employment and, and family and so forth, and then also because of the, the challenges that you talk about. Why, why do people want to step into the breach in the short run? So the question is, how do we create, or is there a plan to create those kinds of mechanisms like foreign, for foreign direct investment does not involve entrepreneurship. Most people are not entrepreneurs. 
So how do we get diaspora bonds implemented? That's the first thing. The second thing has to do with, um, and I don't know if most people are aware of this, we actually have a stock market issue. Um, there is a stock market in Guyana. That's right. Yes. Okay. 16 companies. But, right, 16 companies. But is anybody in this room, and this is not an actual question, it's a rhetorical question, actually investing in those companies? Do we know who they are? Are they publicly, is the information about their performance? My point, my, I'm not talking about people who live here, I'm talking about the average American who is put, or wherever, who's putting their money into 401k plans, who's very familiar with investing directly or indirectly in the stock market, right? That level of information and comfort about one's investments, from my perspective as an investor and a person engaged in economic development, is not present. So again, my question is about foreign direct investment and those two vehicles, and what we might be doing about making them more palatable, available, and so forth for the diaspora. Thank you. All right, quickly, great question, because that goes into capital markets, yes. outside of remittances. Yes. And one of the interesting things about diaspora bonds, 1951, David Ben-Gurion in Israel implemented diaspora bonds, and over the past uh, several years, they have uh, accumulated or uh, generated revenue of over $40 billion, Israel. Ethiopia had its bonds uh, launched in, I think, 2008, Jubilee bonds. Ghana has done it. I think Jamaica is in the process. Uh, okay, Jamaica hasn't completed that. So diaspora bonds is a powerful, powerful tool for getting the diaspora to invest and not return home. Because one of the, one of the problems that we have that we've got to change in perceptions is that we just don't can't think about having the diaspora return. That's antiquated. That's not the way it's done anymore. There are three different ways that the diaspora can get involved without just coming back home. So to answer that question, I'll leave it there. But it's a it's a huge and deep and broad subject that we've got to address. Diaspora bonds, asset backed um, securities, remittance backed mortgages, a combination of things that some folks may not know about. And what my migration and policy experts have said is that one of the problems that capacity building fails is due to the fact of lack of technical know-how, one, and two, adequate budgetary allocations. So that if you do not allocate uh, funding for your diaspora engagement strategy and, and policy areas, then you just can't expect that things will fall into place because the diaspora will always spend their money to make things happen. So it's abroad, it's long, it's deep, and I'll leave it there. It's been too. <coughs> Thank you very much for those questions, and I'm particularly happy for them because they allow me to go back to bits of a presentation yes. that we really glanced over. So um, one of the points that I had in the, in the slides, which I can make available for anyone who wants it, of course, is the fact that designation, a global designation, and a particular investment body is important, uh, are important, sorry. So for example, in Jamaica, the Jamaica Stock Exchange is a designated um, body in Canada. So that means that foreigners from Jamaica in Canada can actually invest by bonds, stocks in Jamaica, and they actually do this tax-free from Canada. So I think that goes to the heart of what you're saying. And this is um, one of the important points that a diaspora policy needs to look at. What, how do we go about encouraging our diasporans to invest in our countries without it being a tax to them? And this is critical. So, so thanks for that. Um, and for sure, there are other ways of, of getting involved. Um, I like this term, beyond rem remittancing. And then for me, that means so much, because and it is not in any way denigrating the impact of remittancing to our countries and our economies, but we're saying that there is so much more long-standing contribution that the diaspora can make and are making, and we need to, to, to find ways of really capturing these. I think um, in, in relation to, to, to the, the whole issue of return. And I, I brought this back up because my, my suggestion is that there are a variety of ways that the diaspora can be tapped into for investment entrepreneurship. And this is from an understanding too that not everyone in the diaspora knows about investment. We're not all entrepreneurs. But the role of policy 
is to make entrepreneurs out of those of us who don't want to or don't know how, which means, um, again, going back to having investment schemes that will target different persons. So for example, for a bond, not all persons in the diaspora may be able to support 100,000 US, but there will be others 10 US, 100 US, creating those instances. But even as it relates to a diaspora bond, that's a deep, intense issue. Um, Jamaica has for years discussed it, and we have to move forward because of the unique challenges. So for any specific country that wants to move to adopt certain strategies, that country has to approach that issue from their context. So it's good to look at the global experiences, and we learn a lot. This is where we get our templates for how to move forward, but we also need to be mindful of what our specific context is and how that will influence the type of policies that we choose. Um, to, to, to one of the questions related to the whole issue of sustainability, um, and for sure, the, the, the whole issue that I introduced of stickiness is about how we can attract the investment, and this is not only by return, there's virtual return. Um, diasporans can um, participate as collaborators in, in the various ways from wherever they are, because this is, that's a brave new world that we're in. So it's not only about um, getting involved through investment, but also how to ensure that we keep that investment in the region. Um, the audience, the interviews for the, the research that we did included those who had returned because again we believe that we needed to focus on those who returned and stayed and those who returned and then left. The first point I want to make is in reaction to some of the issues raised is let us be clear that, yeah, okay, that the action is here in Guyana. People will come to Guyana and invest whether you're diasporans or non diasporans Your human resource and also your financial resources, if there are certain fundamentals in place. So we got to be clear about it. You know, people come from all over the world, not only diaspora. So this is very important that we monitor this, the developments within Guyana to have the fundamentals in place. And the greatest challenge we face, and all money is coming, and we saw what is happening in Venezuela, we see what happened in Nigeria, and so forth, is that we have to have some delineated policy and vision towards moving beyond a commodities economy. And I think that is where the challenge is. As we move beyond that, we'll become very much more attractive to investments, whether from the diaspora or all. Because you guys have to go to the next session, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just want to address uh, the comment you made. Diaspora bonds are definitely one of the main uh, tools for the diaspora investment. It's been done in many countries. We are just also looking at that with Haiti. We had a bit of a stop there because of the change of government. Um, but it is definitely one of the tools used by other countries, and I would just encourage us from a policy perspective to look at the models that have been successful in other countries and work with them. All right, thank you very much. I think you guys have to go to another session, and another session that starts in here, so we've got to end it. Thank you very much thank for your participation. We appreciate it, and we shall move forward.